is, is my mic on? Um, I just want to get my timer on so I can see what, how long I go. Um, there we go. So, yes, yeah, so thank you very much for, for being here and for being all of you. Um, so I'm going to start out, as I think sometimes happens in professorial lectures, with a bit of self-indulgence. And I hope you will indulge me in my self-indulgence. But I wanted to say a little bit about why I do what I do. And the number one reason why I do what I do is for love. Um, I love words. I love words so much that when I was 11 years old, I started a hobby of collecting five-letter given names. And I spent ages on it. I had binders full of five-letter given names that I would study and I would rearrange and I would try to find out things about. And my t uh, teacher, Sister Marguerite, said that was going to get me nowhere, but look. <laughs> um, and so I'm always very excited when I see things like this, you know, the festival of the spoken word, the festival of the word, the festival of words. And then I find out that what these people mean by a festival of words isn't a festival of words. They're, they're reading sentences <laughs> and stories. <laughs> What's, I mean, I want a festival of words where we spend an entire half a day on the, you know? <laughs> that's, that's what I consider a festival of words, and, and that's what I love. And, but, of course, the other way that people get to where they are in, in this kind of situation is through a lot of luck. Right? I was lucky to have the parents I have, to had the teachers I had, all those sorts of things. And I was also a bit lucky, I'm not sure how I actually feel about this, but I was a bit lucky that when I wrote to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Company when I graduated from UMass and said, are you hiring, they said no. Um, and that's how I became an academic. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, my love of words was taking me on. But the, People are, are getting more and more honest about admitting how much luck has a part in their success, I think. But what we don't always celebrate is how much opportunism matters. And so, you know, it's not enough to, to just luck into things. You also need to grab that. And I just want, because I love words, I want to look at that word opportunism for a sec. Here's opportunistic. I am op opportunistic, like infections. Thieves, diseases, crime, criminals, okay? What's wrong with us that we think opportunistic is a bad thing? It's taking, you know, it's taking something that's, that's in front of you that's wonderful that you can take advantage of. I mean, I'm not saying you should do crime, but I am saying that, that we should recognize how, how wonderful it is to take the opportunities that are in front of us. And, you know, so I, I do practice opportunism, and apparently, you know, that makes me cynical, crass, ruthless, and shameless, and I am shameless about it. Um, but in case you don't know, these are, are things from the corpus of global web-based English. This is one of the tools that I use as a linguist to find out about words, you know, to see what context do they happen in, what, what sort of emotional field do they have. But, you know, so if, if nothing else comes out of this talk, I hope that, you know, you might join me in reclaiming the word opportunism and, and seeing it as a good thing. But because I love words, I um, started this blog, as was mentioned, in 2006. And I, you know, use it to write down the things that I discover about how I communicate with people in this country, how they communicate with me, and where we go wrong. You know, for instance, you know, I had to learn that a squint is what I would call cross-eyed. Um, but that's something I would never say in American English. It means something different there. I had to learn that other people don't mean that face. When they say frown, they mean this face. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we learn things about words all the time. I do, and I like to write them down because, you know, I've still got that keeping a binder full of words thing going on, except on the internet. And um, the thing is, people started reading it, and people started reacting to it, and people started talking with me. So I was opportunistic about that. And I started talking to people more. And that's when I started tweeting a difference of the day between British and American English every day since 2009, with very few repetitions, I must say. And that opportunism led me to become a public linguist, to you know, not just write the books for the students 
and for the other linguists, but to start trying to write books for people who um, might be a bit interested in it, but don't have the jargon and, and don't have the, the access to the tools that I have. Okay, so one question that gets asked a lot about doing this sort of public engagement as an academic is, is it worth it? And, you know, these days when, you know, the, the news is full of people saying, you know, some, you know, that, that facts are changing and, and think that people have had enough of experts, it's sometimes, you know, discouraging to, to feel like, you know, I'm doing all this work and, and is anybody ever going to care? But I'm going to say public engagement is absolutely worth it. And I could go through lots and lots of examples of this. But you know, to give one example, um, this is Oliver Cam. He used to work in the city as some sort of financial person. And now he's a political columnist for the Times. And he writes a column on language called The Pedant. And because he reads other linguists like Jeffrey Pullum, Steven Pinker, um, Deborah Cameron, he reads me, um, he writes a really linguistically well-informed um, column that, that denies those things that people are doing in the media. So here he's reacting to a Sky News story about how emojis are ruining English and how young people are ruining English. And he's here to stand up for the young people because he's been reading public linguists. And I think that, you know, if that changes one other person's mind, then that's absolutely worth it. And I just had to add this slide in this morning because I had this in my Twitter this morning. Um, of a woman who, she was on a uh, search committee and somebody who was applying for a job was being down talked for doing up talk, so for ending her sentences as if they're questions. Um, but, you know, due to linguistic discussions, I never would have seen if linguist posts hadn't led me to them. It wasn't even my work, it was just me retweeting people. Um, I effectively defended her. So this was a case of people doing public linguistics and it had an effect on, on you know, trying to strive for equality in our society. So I absolutely do think it's worth it. But, here comes the rest of the talk. Um, but it often goes wrong. Um, and so that's what I wanna look at a bit in a bit more detail today. The ways that language tends to be represented in the press and, and what's going on there. Okay, so I talked about American English in Britain or British reactions to American English in terms of being a mini moral panic. Deborah Cameron writes about a moral panic in Britain in the 90s to do with grammar teaching that came out of the um, nat national curriculum being developed. Um, we do have these little panics in the news about, about where's our language going, is it declining and that sort of thing. But in terms of um, Americanism, you, you get these a lot. You know, so here's three examples, but I could give you many, many, many more examples of how American English is treated in the British press. So it's creeping, it's mangling our English, it's killing, you know, die, die, die. Americanisms are trying to kill the English language. And uh, a bit more than a year ago, this book came out. Um, by Matthew Engel, who's a journalist who's written many columns and done many radio programs about how awful American English is. And I just want to point out his um, subtitle there, The American Conquest of English, as if there are people sitting around in the Pentagon trying to figure out how they can get you to stop saying Laurie. Um, but you know, this is, there's this sort of mindset that Americanisms are out to get um, British English. But the problem that I have is, you know, all right, everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but a lot of times these are opinions are sort of cloaked as fact, or they're often representing linguistic research in, in certain ways, or doing re linguistic research in certain ways. So we've got a lot more um, headlines and bits here from other newspapers and, and the web. And in these cases, these are all citing linguistic research that's been done by academic linguists like myself. So um, coming from studies of the Oxford Children's Corpus, the HSBC Sounds of 2066, which was a report written by an academic linguist and a speech professional for a bank, but nevertheless, you know, couched as an academic 
study and um, the Spoken British National Corpus. So these are, at least two of these are serious academic things. And yet we end up with some claims here that I'm going to show in a minute have, have some problems with them. So if we think about what a moral panic is, and I, I am calling it a mini moral panic. I'm not saying it's like, you know, the debate about immigration or something. But um, this is how sociologists would, would define it. It's someone or something is defined as a threat to the values and interests of the community. That threat is depicted in an easily recognizable form in the media. There's a rapid and disproportionate buildup of public concern. There is a response from authorities or opinion makers, and then either the panic recedes or results in societal changes. And I can see a lot of those things happening with the public discourse about American English. So American English threatens British English. It also, if you read Matthew Engel's book, it threatens Britishness. That if we start using these American words, we're going to lose our British values. We'll be, you know, crass and money obsessed and fat like they are. Which I have to say, you know, Britain, look at your own obesity record. You're not that good. <laughs> but um, but um, the threat is depicted in an easily recognized form in the media. So people don't talk about what's happening with the subjunctive. They say words. These words are coming over to destroy us. Um, and American words are threatening British words. American pronunciations of words. So things like, you know, do you say schedule or schedule? Those are very easy to talk about. They're nice digestible bits of language. The, the buildup of public concern is definitely disproportionate. It's felt more um, strongly amongst listeners of Radio 3 and Radio 4 um, and, and certain other, you know, teachers and, and, and certain other places. Um, but there, and there are regularly responses from authorities and opinion makers. We've already seen there's lots of opinions being expressed in the newspapers. But there's also, there was a House of Lords debate about it in which American English was called the ugliest um, language on the planet. Um, there's an Ofcom inquiry into are British children hearing too much English, American English on the television? Should we take... Um, make efforts to stop that, you know, Sesame Street is going to destroy us all. And um, in the national curriculum, in the SATs, in the advice for how to um, mark children's papers, there is explicit advi um, thing, advice to mark them down for using gotten. I think it's the only word that they tell you to explicitly mark them down for. But you know, they tell you to explicitly mark them down for that and mark them down for American spelling. Um, so lots of opinions. And then the panic recedes and then it reappears later. You know, it comes very cyclically, usually around August when news is slow, right? We get, we get this happening. So we also get the other stuff happening. You know, we also get stuff that's, that's saying, actually, American English is okay. But I just want to point out here that very often that also plays into some of the feelings that are making British people feel insecure about English, or making some British people feel insecure about English. So, for instance, Susie Dent from Countdown um, gave, did a radio program last year called American Eyes. She's giving the Babel Lecture in Huddersfield this week on the same su subject. And I've talked to Susie. This is not what she meant for her program, but it wasn't really her program. It was her producer's program, right? And the whole sort of theme of this was we should love Americanisms because they're so much better than our words, basically. That, that American English is more vital, it's more creative than British English. So in order to you know, say American English is actually okay, it involves stepping into that, you know, there is something wrong with British English thing. American English is actually a threat because we haven't got good enough words in Britain. Um, and I just want to quote Christian Meyer here. I like to quote him because he's German. And he points out many things about biases in British linguistic research. And he's not American, so you can't say it's just that he's got sour grapes. He's German. He's got no skin in this game. So, so you know, he, he notes that there tends to be a, a tendency to celebrate the lexical inventiveness of speakers of new Englishes like American English and represent British English as stodgy and unmoving, which as we will see, is probably not true. But this is not a new feeling. Virginia Woolf was writing about this in the 1920s, that, you know, 
our word coining power has lapsed and therefore the Americans are going to overtake us in creative writing because you know we can't come up with good stuff anymore. Okay. So thinking about this panic, there are various tools that get used in the media. Um, the ones that are sort of in the lighter color there are the ones that I think happen before we get to the newspaper. Those are the problems that are happening in thinking about the problem, in doing the research. So I'll talk about those a bit more. And then we've got the problems in the darker background that actually show up in the media treatments. So um, thinking that just because we've got a correlation, we've got a causation, that if it's, we're losing something in Britain, it must be the Americans' fault, that sort of thing. So we'll look at some examples of those. So a big one is the use of foregrounding in the media. So if we look at this article, so British children turn to American English as you would turn to a life of drugs and prostitution. <laughs> um, you've got the headline, you've got the stand first or the subhead, British children are increasingly using American English in their writing. This is a story about the BBC Two 500 words competition that happens every year where children write and submit short stories. Um, and according to a report based on entries. So it, Oxford University studies these stories each year. After that, and of course the, the story goes on for another screen after what I can show you here. But after that, there is one sentence in the article about American English. Americanisms such as cupcake, garbage truck, trash can, candy, sidewalk and soda were found in many entries. How many? I mean, was it six or seven or how many words that is or was it, was it a lot? Um, and so you go on from there into the article and you find that the, actually the point of the article is, is summed up in this quote by one of the judges that at a microscopic level, children's use of language is robust and imaginative. They know the value of a well-chosen word. And so, you know, Who's to say that sidewalk was not a well-chosen word, that it wasn't in the mouth of an American character? We'll never know. It was just, you know, it was there, so it had to be commented on. But the main point of the story is, aren't our children wonderful? And this is how they led the story. We've got another case of foregrounding in this HSBC report, um, which came out, I think, in 2016. And so we've got the table of contents here, and notice that the longest title in the table of contents that's taking up the most space is informalization of English, talking to machines and listening to Americans. Notice also that it only goes on for one page, right? So it's got this big title, but it's only got one page. And then the thing that's actually the point of the study, Sounds of the City, the part of the study that says, the way that British English is changing is that we're getting more pan-regional dialects rather than, you know, sort of small local dialects. That's just lost in that little title there. That gets seven pages. But when you look at page six, there's actually only a half a page on this subject, and there's actually only one sentence that mentions America. Okay? The fact that so many innovations, that's to say technological in innovations, come from California is undoubtedly linked to our inf more informal English these days. Okay, that's all they say. So they're uh, blaming Google or whatever for Bodhi McBoatface and various other things. Um, but that's the only mention of America. And I also want to point out here what they conclude about that is how much more democratic and liberated our linguistic lives have become. Now that sounds like a good thing to me democratic, liberated, I like those things. But if we look at how the, the press covered this story, that foregrounding of Americanisms, uh, of Americanness in that subheading had a big effect. And so we see the sun, listening to Americans will bring about the decline of a regional dialects. Now recall they did not say that in that page about Americans. American English will become increasingly common in our country. Um, talking to machines and listening to Americans will stop regional accents being prominent. And The Guardian, some of you think you like The Guardian, <laughs> says by 2066, all dialect words will be no more. I mean, they didn't say a word about dialect words 
in this report. It was about accent, and then it had that paragraph about informalization. That's all we have. But that's what the news did with that. And I would say part of that's because that was foregrounded in that, in that heading. Okay. Um, more seriously, to come out of this, uh, the same report was the Sun and the, and the um, Daily Mail blamed immigration for the loss of, uh, for, for uh, more and more t what we call TH funding, so saying think instead of think. And you know, it will be, there, nobody will say th anymore by 2066. I might actually be alive in 2066. I plan on saying th, but that, you know, um, but you know, to, to then, you know, turn that into part of the anti-immigration moral panic is another matter. So should we be blaming the, re the media and not the researchers? Um, well, sometimes it certainly seems so. So you've got this article in the Telegraph, the controversy over changing pronunciations. To language purists, they might great, but new ways of pronouncing words are um, spreading in Britain thanks to the influence of US culture. Now you read the article and you read what the researcher actually said. Johnny Robinson, curator of socio sociolinguistics at the British Library, is that the best job title or what, um, said um, that it's a peculiarly British pronunciation controversy. People complain about it, they think it's American, but there's no evidence that Americans use it. But you wouldn't know that if you only read the headline, would you? Um, so in this case, we've got the researcher doing the right thing, you know, saying, saying the facts, having looked into them, and, and the Telegraph misrepresenting him, I would say. But is it always um, the, the media? So here's the Telegraph again. Cheerio, pussycat, hi there, awesome English. Use of cheerio is dying out as the English language becomes more Americanized. Now I want you to think about what's the Americanism that's taken over from cheerio. Is there one? I mean, I listen and people say bye-bye. Americans didn't make that one up, you know? Americans did not make a goodbye. Cheerio was a, a fad word from 1910 or so that, you know, was very popular for a little while and has been declining ever since. Is that because of Americanisms? I kind of doubt it, because language just changes anyway. Um, did awesome kill marvelous? Um, which is part of what the article says. Well, uh, Marvelous was already on a steep decline because it had its height in the early 20th century by the time Awesome came around. What happened to Brilliant? What happened to Amazing? Those are the words that killed off Marvelous. But, you know, instead we've got the American one um, being represented here. Now, do we blame the Telegraph for that or do we look at the Cambridge University press release for this, which says is pretty much quoted, you know, chunked over into the Telegraph article. I mean, those sorts of sloppy thinking, you know, connecting the rise of one word to the decline of another word when they're decades apart, you know, is in this press release. So language, the language change narrative needs an enemy in order to make it newsworthy. And in this case, it looks like sometimes UK researchers and UK institutions, and I'm not saying that people in other countries don't do this with other subjects, but you know, are willing to provide it in the form of Americanisms. Okay. Um, and again, you know, do we blame the media or do we blame the researchers? Here, it, again, to do with this Sounds of 2066 um, thing, we saw the media really misrepresenting what was in the report. But we also see one of the author rep of authors of the report saying in print that comedy shows in particular have had a significant influence in bringing Americanisms to um, England and to Britain. There's absolutely no research on this. You know, box set binging is what could be one reason why. But nobody's done any research on it. The only research that I know of that showed um, dialect change due to television was one showing that what young people who watch EastEnders in Glasgow use um, TH fronting, say think instead of think. Um, you know, that's not 
comedy show box sets from America. So, so why are we saying things like this in, in the press? Again, another one. So, oops, sorry. Um, the conversation, which of course is built for academics to find a platform in public. Now, I happen to know, um, because I was asked to write it, that this was a commissioned article by, by the conversation, not one that, that uh, somebody offered to them based on their research. Um, that, you know, wh what will the English language be like in a hundred years? And so this article says, the future for English is one of multiple Englishes. And then three sentences later it says, in the future to be, speak English will be to speak U.S. English. Okay, so we've got two different things going on there, but it is being presented as, as work by somebody at a very prestigious university. Um, and when we go on to read the evidence that we will speak U.S. English in the future, all of the evidence has to do with spelling, because this happens to be this person's specialty. Um, but, you know, so spelling such as disk and program are already preferred in computing jargon. Um, but the dominance of U.S. usage will lead to the wider acceptance of other American spelling preferences. That's spelling that's not speaking, number one. But number two, what are the American preferences? This person has just assumed that Americans prefer to spell certain words certain ways because those spellings exist. But dialogue without a U-E is not how Americans spell dialogue. It's how computing people spell dialogue. It's a bit of computing jargon. But it's not the American spelling. Um, as you can see, it's the, um, you know, like 14 times more, 14, I can't count. Anyway, lots, lots, lots more in, uh, in with the UE than without. And in the case of donut versus donut, just because there are two spellings doesn't mean that the one that isn't used in Britain is the American preference. It's not the American preference. It's an advertising spelling that's, you know, been made possible, made prominent by certain, um, certain companies that use it in their spelling. Okay, so those are some problems there with, with just assuming you know a little bit too much about American English and publishing about it without looking into the facts. Um, but another problem in this whole thing is, is ignoring what's happening in Britain, looking for that enemy in the language change um, story and, and finding America. But if you look at what's happening in Britain, um, Jeremy Butterfield looked at how many words were originally American that were added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 1913 and 1933, and I used his method and looked at a couple more. Um, decades. And you can see there in, he found 66% of the words were coming from America. In 1973, I found that 50% of the words were coming from America. I should pause here and say that the OED has a New York office that is staffed, that is actively looking for American English. So it's not just a matter of they didn't know about the American English. Um, but I've made 1953 read there because that's sort of the only point in this at which Americans are almost contributing as much to the Briti as the British to the language per capita, if you see what I mean. There are five times more American English speakers than British English speakers. We should expect there to be more new American words. The Ab American economy is six times bigger than the British economy. We should expect more inventions and jargon and things to come from it. So, you know, this is not a bad story about British English. This is actually a good story about British English. So there are good stories to be told about the creativity of British English. There are also stories to be told about who some of the other possible quote-unquote enemies are in, in the language change narrative. So if we look at something like a word like backend, does anybody use this word? Okay. So in, 19, in the 1950s, when they were doing a um, dialect survey of Britain, well, actually, they only did England in the 1950s, backend was the way that people in the north referred to the season from September to November. Okay? In 2016, everybody uses the word autumn. They're not using the Americanism fall. They're using the southeasternism um, autumn. So the Frenchism 
autumn. You know, so, so it's the southeast that's driving a lot of the linguistic change in America, er, not in America, in Britain. Um, but you know, that's not what the BBC necessarily wants to point out, or the Telegraph, or all those you know, London media types. So that, that's not the enemy they want to ma make in the press. Um, on the other hand, oh, this is really hard to see on the screen, I think. But um, actually, if I, I was supposed to change these lights. Can you see a bit more? Yes. That um, in the Southwest and on the East Coast, in the 1950s, some people's preferred word for that season was fall. Okay? So fall, if you hit, find fall in, in Britain, it's not necessarily because it's come over from America. If it's in the phrase, spring forward, fall back, for your clocks, then yes, yeah, that did come from America. But, but there were people in some of our lifetimes using fall in Britain because it was the word for that season. And you have to wonder there if part of the reason they don't say it anymore is because when they'd say it, people would say, don't be American. I don't know if people saw the, um, con the controversy about um, paper chase having Mother's Day cards that said, you know, I love you, mom. And, and the, you know, the Telegraph was all over it, the Times was all over it, the BBC was all over it, saying, look at those Americans ruining our relationships with our mothers. Um, and then all the people from Birmingham said, but that's what we say, right? But they're sort of being forced away from saying it because it's stereotyped as being something unlikable. Okay, and you know, so, General, in general, a lot of the change that's happening in Britain, linguistically, is internally driven. And we're not seeing, always seeing that story when we're looking at these stories about foreign interlopers possibly changing the Eng English. Um, and, and just to, to point out, I won't go through all these because I don't want to spend too much time, but on the bottom one, pronunciations like controversy, garage, privacy, those have arisen in Britain. Britain is, a le is an innovative linguistic place. It makes changes all the time. Um, it's not the, the conservative old language that people sometimes assume it is. Okay? The other thing to look for here is that Americanization is only one possible explanation in some of these cases. So we mentioned schedule and privacy, which you do hear younger people more and more saying schedule and privacy. Now, there are a couple of things going on here, one of which is that this, there was a debate at one point in England about whether it should be schedule or schedule. That was a long time ago, so it's probably not what's affecting it. But when the first edition of the Oxford English Dictionary came out, the pronunciation for that second word was privacy, okay? and it's only more recently that they've represented it as being privacy. So rather than Americans bringing over that privacy pronunciation, maybe it just never entirely went away here. But another possible explanation here is that those are sort of, if you only found those words in print, because of the way English spelling works, because most words that start with S-C-H start with S-C, you might be more um, apt to assume that that's pronounced schedule. If you know the word private, it's not a big step to assume that's privacy. So another um, Another thing that could be going on there is not just that the Americans are taking over, but that people are, are pronouncing those words from print and learning them that way. Okay, so those are some of the things that I think we need to look out for in, in media accounts of um, American English in, in Britain. And also we need to, to look out for them when, as linguists when we start to look at language change and think what are the other possibilities it could be. Um, but what's behind this panic? So native speaker overconfidence. And, and one of the things that especially writing the blog has taught me is how humble one needs to be about one's own language. Because your experience of English is like this big. You know, it's the things that you've heard and you've read, the people you've talked to, right? But English is humongous. So to say, we don't say that, we British people don't say that, is a problem because you, you know, you're thinking about the people in your little bubble. Um, to say Americans always do that 
is also a problem because you're not over there looking at that. Um, getting old is a problem. I probably don't need to tell you this. Um, that when you are, you know, when I talk to my students about these issues, they're like, yeah, well, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because the words uh, that people are complaining about as Americanisms aren't Americanisms to them. They're just English. They've grown up with them. Um, these days, people are complaining about um, the Americanism. Reach out. I'll reach out to you later on that. You know, as a as a businessy kind of way of saying contact. And they'll say, oh, why can't people just say they'll contact you? But you know, your your grandparents' generation, they were complaining about that new Americanism, the verbed noun contact. Um, you know, we grew up with contact being a verb. We don't think of it as some weird thing. Um, so, but you get to be middle-aged and suddenly people are saying things you don't say. And then you go, oh, wait a minute, you know? <laughs> it's those kids watching Sesame Street. We're never going to get over it. Um, then technophobia is another thing. So you see the, the American assumptions coming in in these articles about things like speech recognition software or about, you know, when, when um, we started word processing. You know, everybody's like, oh, you know, spell check is going to make us all spell the same. Um, I haven't put slides in it about it here, but in my book I discuss how actually the opposites happened. Our spelling is getting more different. Um, but, you know, there, there's, we don't seem to learn from this. So in the 90s, everybody was saying, maybe it was the early aughties, um, that, that, oh, children can't spell anymore because they use textisms. You know, they spell later, L-H-R, you know, and things like that. Does that happen anymore? No, if you do that, you're a dinosaur because there is predictive text now. The, the technology moves faster than the language does because the technologists are motivated to let you communicate in your language. And so just like we no, don't have to do stupid abbreviations in text anymore, we can pretty much assume that we will be able to talk to Alexa or Echo or whatever thing it is in our own accents, you know, not in the unimaginable future, or in the imaginable future. But the other thing that I want to look at a little bit more is what I call the post-empire outlook on English. So, again, I'm quoting, I want to say my friend Christian, but we've never met. Um, but I, lo I, love, I love to use his quotes because, again, he's not American, he's not British, he's just looking at the situation. That um, popular discussions hopefully, hopelessly overemphasize the influence of American English because of a transfer of feelings about America to its language and fear about the political, cultural, and um, economic domination of that country. And I think that's particularly hard for the country that used to be that country, that used to have half the world, in a sense. Um, and so that sort of transferred onto the language, that, that the spread of the English language is now sort of the acceptable face of that empire. You know, oh yes, slavery was really bad, but everybody's got English now, you know? Um, isn't that great? Right, so Jeremy Paxman, it's, it, the language is the greatest legacy the English have bequeathed the rest of humanity. Um, Prince Charles saying that we must act to ensure that English English stays the language of the world. Um, we've got here, this is the British Council who um, are sort of a quango that um, institutes the, was, is one of four owners of the IELTS English language test. Um, and, you know, here's the, uh, the director of English and exams for the British Council used to be, I thought this was interesting, much of his business career has been in international consumer product marketing. And now the consumer product he's marketing is English. Um, and the thing about English is it's so wonderful. It facilitates dialogues and builds trust. It brings a fairer, more prosperous, safer, and more secure world. I mean, it's the UK's greatest gift to the world. That, you know, by spreading English, we're spreading English values um, and, and giving that to the world in a certain way. Okay, and this is the government again saying, you know, English creates opportunities for countries. We, you know, we need to export 
um, our language. And you can see that, that I mean, it's hard to get a, an overall figure for how much English, the English language is worth to the British economy because it's sort of in different places. I think I read six or seven billion once, but I cannot find that, that citation. But just the schools that we have, you know, like on every corner in Brighton teaching English, that's a 1.2 billion pound industry. The UK publishing export market is, you know, they're one of the biggest export publishers in the world. And two thirds of the publishing that's exported from Britain is educational and EFL titles. Um, and the British Council, as, as part owner of the IELTS test, I was trying to find out how much the IELTS test makes for Britain each year, but as part owner, they made um, 650 million last year off of that test. So, so you know, when we talk about globalization and, and that kind of thing, I, well, I'm gonna go to my, ah, I missed a slide. Where's my clicker? Did I skip it? Yeah, all right, no, it was up there. Globalization isn't always Americanization. And I think those two, two terms tend to be used often as synonyms when we talk about the English language and about globalization generally. Um, but it isn't always. It's, it's very much EFL is, is a UK industry. So if you look at something like the, the dictionaries that are made for learners of English, the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary, which is sort of the biggie, first published 70 years ago. The first American dictionary for learners of English was only published 10 years ago. Um, this is a, a market that, that the UK has been dominating for some time. And so, you know, as I say, I think English has become the acceptable face of that empire. And, and to have another person, or another, not another person, another country sort of sharing in, in English there is, it does feel a bit threatening, I think. So, my last bit that I want to say is how can we help? Because we're nice people and we want to help. Um, linguists and, and people who are not linguists who are, but who are interested in these kinds of things can help by doing good research, by reading the research critically, and by reading the media reports of that new, um, research critically. So don't make stuff up. You know, if the news calls you, you know, the news calls on poets a lot to comment on how the English language is doing. You know, I'm, I'm never quite sure about that, but they just say what's on their mind. You know, don't make stuff up. Identify your assumptions, both in reading about this stuff, but also in doing research about this stuff. If you're a linguist, use objective data collection methods and look for the other explanations. Just because it's like what Americans do, did it come from America? Correlation is not causation. Um, I just want to point out this book that came out shortly before mine did. This is, one is for an academic audience. It's not, it's not as funny as my book. Um, but, um, but what's nice about it is Paul Baker, he's up at, at Lancaster. Um, he um, you know, tried to take as objective a, uh, a look at this as, as he could. And so he used a corpus-driven method which is meant to find the differences rather than to start from, I think this has changed and therefore I, you know, I find that this changed. And having done that, at the end of the book, he says the two nations are maintaining their differences. That's you know, what you get when you get a more objective um, look at it. I was a little bit suspicious of this bit where American English tends to be in the forefront of change at the grammatical level. So things like Americans have been dropping use of the passive much faster than British people have, um, use of certain modal verbs and things like that. Um, and I was a little bit worried about the part where he says, in that chapter, I've tried to focus on the most dramatic aspects of change. That's where I think, okay, but wait a minute, we need to talk about the things that don't change too. You know, looking just at the changes is, is only telling part of the story. But how else we can help? We can engage with people. If you're a linguist, you can be a public linguist. If you're a poet, you can be a public poet. If you're a physicist, you can be a public physicist. Um, if you communicate clearly, bust the myths, celebrate the language varieties, um, and don't wait to be asked to do so. You know, tell people how wonderful um, language is and how much it can hold. Okay? Don't let the media dictate the story. 
So there, talk about lack of change as well as about change. Talk about the sustainability of variation. So people, when they write these panicky letters about, or panicky articles about um, young people and how they talk, they're never going to get a job. And you think, well, actually, I don't talk the way that I talk to my parents or my kid or anybody else the way I talk in a job interview. Why? Why would they? Um, you know, so we've got lots of, of potential to vary linguistically, both as individuals and as societies, and we don't need to panic. To complain when anyone distorts the story. Now, the old way to do that is to write a letter to the editor and hope it gets published. But the new way to do that is to go on social media and say, look at this ridiculous story. You know, look at the faulty assumptions here. And that's what's getting picked up more and more in the press, and that's what's go doing the good job and avoid predicting the future. Um, and I have to here pause and, and put up a picture of my friend Sandra, who Sandra and Lynn Cahill, who's over there, and I and Phil, my husband, we were a writing group who sat around a table at a cafe, and that's where I wrote The Prodigal Tongue. So I have to pay respect to uh, Sandra, who's in Germany now. Um, and, and this article that she's just published about things like the HSBC study, um, arguing, and, and I must just say, say, when you actually talk to her, she says it much more strongly than linguists might want to think twice about making predictions. She gets really angry about it. But, but she makes you know, various points about this. Predictions about the future, language future is very difficult to predict. And so they're usually not based on research. They don't hold true in many cases. But most of all, the public does not benefit from them. The newspapers really want to run these stories, but we don't have to give them to them because we can't do that responsibly, so let's not. Okay, and how linguists and others, any, any um, public scholar, any scholar can do is to recognize that everything that we do has political and social weight. So consider how your message might be received. You know, if you're writing about something that's changing and there are certain people who are um, involved in that change, be they, say, London inner city youth, perhaps, or immigrants or something else like that, do consider how that's going to be spun in the sun. And, and think about the ways that you, what you can do to try to keep that spin from happening and send positive messages about linguistic change and other things happening in our world that are just natural, natural things. Does that work if we do all those things? Occasionally. But it's working more and more, I think. And so I really think it's worth doing. OK? And on that note, I want to thank you. So thank you very much.